the Pure Exposure Growth Series live stream, sponsored by E-Trade and the CME Group. You are being exposed. Bob Iacchino here from the Pure Exposure Growth Series. Welcome to our live stream again. If you don't know what we do here, we basically expose you purely to the truth in trading and active investing. With me as always, I've got several high profile, experienced guests. First of all, in the studio, I've got Roger Curry, who is the founder and CEO of the Market Forecasting Academy on Skype. I've got Jay Soloff from Investors Alley, and I've got Tony Zhang, who you know before, uh, Chief Strategist from Options Play. Let me go to Roger first, since you're under these hot lights with me here. Tell me a little bit about the Market Forecasting Academy, uh, what you do there, what made you get started in this? Absolutely, uh, you know, one of the biggest complaints that all traders experience is basically inconsistent market performance, right? right? And I was, I was a victim of that myself for almost 14 years before I figured out um, there were eight major market forces that have to be taken into account if you want to be consistent, mm -hmm. right? Well, most traders focus on technical analysis, fundamental analysis, or maybe a combination of, of both, mm -hmm. but that's just two out of eight. So that leaves you with six other factors that can blindside you. And so what we do at uh, Market Forecasting Academy is teach traders how to incorporate those in their analysis for accurate and consistent market forecasting. So maybe protects you a little bit against the black swans that we're about to talk about. Absolutely, I'll good, give you good. some insights on that today. Good. Jay Soloff, Investors Alley, yep. options guy. Uh, tell me a little bit about Investors Alley, about yourself, and how long it took you to get that great beard, man. I've been trying and I just can't get there. <laughs> Uh, my wife won't let me shave it once I, I grew it a couple of years ago, so it's it's permanent, I think. Good. Um, Investors Alley is a uh, financial publishing company. Uh, I focus on options education. Uh, my background is uh, is as a market maker in uh, index and uh, single equity options on the SIBO. Um, actually started at the Kansas City Board of Trade in futures, but moved to Chicago to learn the option business. And uh, after my floor days, I mostly focused on uh, investor education as it relates to options trading. So speaking of options, Tony Zhang, the name of your company is Options Play. You've been on before, but we've got some new viewers, so just give me a minute on why you're so special. I know why you're so special, but I want you to tell them. Well, thanks so much for having me back, first of all. My name is Tony Zhang. I'm the chief strategist here at Options Play, and we are a financial technology company, and our mission is to purely build the most intuitive options education and platform for retail and financial advisors to be able to analyze the markets the same way the professionals do and provide as much research and color around the market so that people understand how we look at the market and then provide them the tools to be able to analyze the markets on their own. So we've got a mix of experiences here. We've got a couple of guys that focus really on the individual retail traders. Tony and I have more of an institutional background. So let's dive right into what's going on here. We've got the S&P, the Dow, the NASDAQ kind of getting hit on a number of factors. And for those of you that don't know what a black swan is, a black swan event essentially is an event that catches the market by surprise, right? 1867, throughout the world it was known there were only white swans, there were black swans discovered in Australia, which turned zoology on its head. So a black swan event is an event that surprises the market, but then in hindsight, it's a weird little dynamic about the definition, in hindsight, people say that they should have seen that coming. That's basically sort of the criterion for a black swan. So right now we have COVID-19, otherwise known as the coronavirus. Coronavirus is affecting markets, but in conversations with uh, Tony, who's actually uh, our director of this particular show and some of the other traders, there's some dispute as to whether this is a black swan event or not, simply because of how much it's built. It wasn't really something that took the markets by storm. So Roger, your opinion, is this a black swan event or is it something we can prepare for? Actually, I don't believe it is. Um, you could see a, a retrace, you know, the market can pull back, but I don't see that as a, as a threat. In fact, uh, for, for those long-term uh, buy and hold, you're, you're totally fine. You've got plenty of time to, to react. Right now, there's a lot of bullish su uh, support participants in the market that are really carrying a lot of where price is now. And in fact, I see markets going even higher uh, in, the, in the medium to, to, yeah, I'd say about the medium term. So is it fair to say you look more at supply and dynam di uh, demand dynamics underlying the market or Absolutely. momentum or both? A actually all of the above. And that's the trouble that traders get themselves into is they look at one aspect or one facet or two facets of, of the whole 
And so we like to have a 360 degree view of the market. Once you have that, you'll realize that it's literally impossible for the market to actually correct or even crash in a significant way that uh, without you knowing that there's something you should take defensive action on ahead of time. Just like you can't walk under a clear blue sky and have it start raining on top of you, right? right you right. gotta have clouds and you have to have the right conditions for that cloud to produce so rain. So you wanna see the clouds rolling in? Absolutely, so I, I, I don't so see that So right you're good now. with medium term? Absolutely. Okay, long ES. Jay, what about you? Do you see this as a black swan event or do you see this as something you kinda wanna take advantage of because you have time to? I agree with Roger uh, in the sense that you should have time to position yourself, but uh, I do think that we have some pain to come. I mean, just look at the Apple results today. I think that that is indicative of what we're going to see with a lot of other uh, big name stocks. Anybody that has any sort of supply chain that goes through China, um, you know, the VIX curve right now, the VIX uh, term structure is not too scary, but it could change in a hurry. And that's the sign for me that you need to start being more defensive. Let's actually talk about Apple, Tony, if we could, because um, first give me your opinion on whether COVID-19, again, no one's calling it COVID-19 yet, it has a name. Formerly known as the coronavirus, COVID-19, is it a black swan event? Is it something that you kind of see coming, prepare for? And direct relationship to Apple, because obviously Apple, as Jay mentioned, guided down, they guided lower because of the virus. Now, I think all of us know, because we've all been in the markets double digit years, that oftentimes companies can take advantage of these situations and guide lower. And then they beat the guidance as it goes forward and then they jump over that sort of lowered bar when the next earnings season comes. So Tony, do we have a black swan event with coronavirus and how does that relate in the way you see Apple right now, which we've got a chart up behind me? At the moment, I don't see this as a black swan event. I actually see this as an opportunity. And if you look at price action this morning, I think it's pretty clear. You know, you had that sell off down to about 310 right when we opened in pre market, and now it's trading back up around 317. Same thing with Walmart, missed earnings, but is now trading higher than where it closed on Friday. So I think these are all opportunities to potentially. Uh, you know, get long as 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 you get these pullbacks. Um, you know, in the grand, as he was saying before, in the grander scheme of things, I do think that we're actually going to continue moving higher in, in maybe in the, over the next month or two in the market. So any pullback, in my opinion, is a buying opportunity at the moment. Uh, what about the pullback in Walmart? I'll, I'll start with you, Tony, because looking at it from a perspective of what happened with Walmart earnings, when I look at Walmart earnings, uh, they were pretty bad, right? One thirty-eight mm -hmm. a share. Uh, revenue climbed 2%, but the street was expecting around 143. They were the, they beat on revenue, so it did climb, but that EPS kind of weighed the stock's down, shares down initially in pre-market, but they're up now. So Tony, how do you feel right. about Walmart specifically? So Walmart, I think, uh, well, you know, Walmart, which I think is a somewhat bellwether of, of the consumer market uh, and the market itself, I, I think what you currently see is this is the disconnect that that I think many traders are feeling right now is how are the markets continuing higher when things don't seem to be going that well uh, across the board. And, and I think a lot of it comes down to the, the Fed continuing to pump liquidity, not only our central bank, but central bank around the world continuing to pump liquidity into the system. And, and that's what we're currently seeing is we're seeing that liquidity inflate the equity assets in, in, in the world, including, you know, stocks like Walmart, Apple. Um, but at the same time, you know, we're seeing some, some, some inflationary assets or, or um, defensive assets like gold still continuing to rally as, as more equity markets continue to make all time highs. And that's a disconnect that I think most traders are trading these days. Do we look at gold as an inflationary asset anymore? I mean, from my perspective, like when I've looked back at gold and I, I see the face you just made, so I think you might be semi agreeing with me that over the last, say, 15 years or so, gold hasn't really performed well as an inflation hedge. But if you go over 50 years, it's not a bad track record. So, Tony, is that dynamic changing? And then I want to go to Jay because Jay's specialty is volatility. So I want to touch on that as well. Um, hard to say if the dynamic is changing, but the data over the last 10, 15 years certainly suggests that. Um, but I, I, sorry, I meant more defensive rather than gotcha. inflationary. Gotcha. Understood. Jay, from a volatility perspective, so we're looking mm -hmm. at Walmart, which pre-market was down. Now we're looking at a Walmart chart and it's a little bit higher, right? It's actually looks like gapped up to about 119 uh, prior to the open. So 
volatility in general, if we don't have a black swan event, are you able to kind of look at that from a volatility sort of lens? Or is this something where you don't really care what drives it, you're just reacting to what happens and what are you seeing? I think that uh, it's a little bit of both. I mean, some of it is looking at the at the actual metrics of volatility, the, st the statistics, and and doing something based on that. But there needs to be a story, generally speaking. I mean, volatility doesn't uh, doesn't go crazy for no reason. You know, there's usually something underlying. Uh, there's definitely been more fear with uh, with COVID nineteen. There's been a little bit more. I mean, if you look at the the VIX term structure, you can see very pronounced higher volatility expectations around uh, the election and Super Tuesday. So there's generally a story involved along with uh, various supply demand dynamics and order flow. So we still have put skew is what you're telling me. Absolutely, in, in, in the index, although it's it's not what it used to be uh, because you have so many people uh, overriding to, to earn yield because yields are so low on fixed income. So they're not protecting as much as they used to. I'm looking at eight major factors that move the market, Roger. And your third one is volatility. So yeah. that's one of the things we're talking about. So just touch on that one for a second and tell me where that goes into your sort of modeling. And then I want to get to back to these two guys and see if there's any specific trades they're looking at. It's really interesting. And, and, and volatility is number three, not, you know, not by coincidence, right? It's right up there. And actually, if you notice, technical analysis is number eight because that's really being affected by all the other seven above that. Uh, volatility is, has a major impact because that really plays on people's emotions. So uh, it's not to be ignored. However, you can't also look at it in an isolated fashion. So just because volatility is there doesn't mean I need to react solely based on that or, or, or put too much weight on volatility without understanding the impact of the other seven around it. Volatility a friend or foe? Right now, to be honest with you, I think it's, it's I, I would it, make it neutral, I would ignore it. I would, so I would like, look at everything. We're, it's like we're, a neighbor you wave to, but you don't really care to have At this point, over. I would say yeah. so. Jake, volatility right now, friend or foe for the individual trader? Well, the curve is relatively flat, the VIX term structure, uh, so it's pretty neutral. Um, if it does go into backwardation, which if you're a future trader, you know that's the front month is greater than the second month then it could be a friend if you want to go long volatility. So that's just something to keep an eye on, I think, in this environment. Tony, do you ever go long volatility? Uh, all the time. Yeah. Um, you know, I use long calls and puts and debit spreads in my trading quite a bit when I have a strong directional view. And a lot of it is guided based on uh, relatively lower volatility environments when I take those types of positions. So volatility is very important in my trading, but more so on the single stock side than more so on the whole market side. And because we are seeing a lot of, uh, we're, we're seeing the the equity markets when we talk about the VIX and the S&P 500 having relatively low volatility. But when we look at single name, it's actually not that low. And we're actually seeing a lot of opportunities to sell vol um, in, in names that are fairly volatile. And we're seeing a lot of volatility in, in individual names, especially going into earnings, taking advantage of that, selling volatility going into earnings. Um, we haven't seen a lot of stocks make big moves on earnings this particular quarter. So, um, you know, it's been it's been great for, for selling vol, but, you know, there's been plenty of opportunities to buy vol going into earnings. Look at GE, look at Intel, um, e even Walmart, I think, you know, we, we I was quite bullish and I have some calls on Walmart going into earnings. Um, you know, I'm fortunately uh, was I'm short Apple and looks like, you know, despite this recent sell off or, you know, today, it looks like it's pulling right back up. So maybe that that wasn't such a great trade. Yeah, I think, Jay, this is like a telltale thing to me because when you're looking, in my experience, when you're looking at a market like this and you've got news like Apple just gave us and it's not going lower, that to me isn't necessarily, I mean, you know, Roger talked about technical analysis and for us at Path Trading Partners, technical analysis is essentially, can we get into the trade or not, right? That's I've talked about this on the show before. What we do at Path Trading Partners is we come up with a fundamental view, that's generally me and Mike Arnold, who's going to be on the show later, can either veto my view or he can agree with it and he has veto power and it drives me. Actually, I hate it because I want to do <laughs> stupid things and he won't let me. But when you look at technical analysis, Roger, do you look at it as like, this is how we enter or don't enter? This is how we get out or don't get out? Is that sort of your, your Absolutely. process Absolutely. Technical analysis has its place and, and really specifically for entries, exits, managing the, the position while 
encompassing all, it, taking into account all the other uh, factors, mm -hmm. but, but that is a, a key uh, indication for what we do, what actions should we take when we look at the whole. Absolutely. So I want to touch on something real quick. We got a question in our YouTube comments that I want to talk about for a quick second. Uh, Oliver Rios asked about our thoughts on gold and crude. Although the corona business is concerning, are we just fighting central banks? And that's something that Tony brought up. So first of all, Oliver, if you're watching, I want to tell you that we're going to do a whole segment on gold and crude. Um, we've got one of the best crude oil guys out there, Anthony Grisanti, my buddy Grizz, the CNBC guy. Um, we've disagreed on CNBC before and I've been wrong, and again, I hate that. But from a perspective of the Fed, Tony, so the way that I take in markets, the way that I look at markets is, I don't generally opine on what's correct uh, financially, ethically, or financially, morally. I don't look at why, I look at what, right? So, Tony, I know you kind of think that way as well. So, what you, Global Central Banks, does this reverse? I mean, we already have the experience where the Fed tried to kind of unwind not only QE, but raise rates a little bit, and the pressure on the equity markets was dramatic. So, do you see the Fed as ever getting back involved? I know ever's a long time. Like, if you say never, I mean, you could die and you'll still be wrong. So, like, what, do you see that in the sort of horizon at all or no? I find it very difficult, um, and and not just the Fed, but global central banks on raising rates because of exactly what you just said, um, it, it, and 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 this causes a lot of problems down the road, right? Because if we don't raise rates, and let's say the next recession or global recession is a few years away, what ammunition do we have left to 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 figure things out, right? Um, so that's my biggest concern for the next turndown is actually the, the ability, the lack of ability of, of central banks to raise rates now when things are good to normalize so that we have ammunition when the next recession comes. Jay, how do you feel about the central bank issue? I think that they get blamed for a lot of things that uh, is not not necessarily uh, anything they can, they can control, but uh, there is some, you know, there's certainly some truth to what Tony's saying about uh, with rates ultra low, and only a limited amount that you can go negative in the curve, you know, then you have to start looking at alternative forms of quantitative easing and things like that to try to provide at least a placebo to the market. So uh, definitely could be interesting if we have another downturn on what central banks may do and what ammunition they have. All right, we've got um, market open coming up in about nine, about eight minutes or so. So when we come back, I'm gonna come back to you with the central bank question, just broad strokes. And then I want to talk to the guys on set as to whether they have any specific trades they want to look at at Market Open. So stay with us. We'll be right back. You've just been exposed. This is my headquarters. This is where I trade and manage my portfolio. Since I added futures, I have access to the oil markets and gold markets. Okay. I'm plugged into equities, trade confirmed. And I have global access 24 seven, meaning I can do what I need to do. Then I can focus on what I wanna do. Visit learnfuturestoday.com to see what adding futures can do for you. Welcome back, everybody. Thanks for sticking with us. I want to go to Roger because we talked about the Fed just before we left with the other two guys on the screen here. And you have these eight factors that move the markets, right? This is kind of what you've based your entire development, uh, becoming as su successful as I know you are. So is the Fed, where does the Fed fit in on those eight factors you watch? Yeah, the Fed is very, very important. In fact, it's right under fundamentals, right? So that's part of the macro uh, economic effects. Geopolitical forces are right lumped into the, the central bank uh, decisions. Uh, that has a huge weight. And so I would not dismiss that or take that too lightly. So I'd be watching that closely. However, the nice, nice little caveat here is the fact that they can't by themselves just swoop in and have 
a, a downpour suddenly on the market. Uh, all, all the other factors have to come into line, right? So understanding that these are more complicated, give me like two, three words on each one of these eight and then we'll move on. Um, really, to, to simplify it, I would say that each, each aspect that we look at is going to be just one singular facet. And so you, you really can't look at them as any one thing standalone um, indication to take a, uh, make a decision on. If you do and when you do, you'll find that your long-term results will become inconsistent. When you look at them uh, holistically, uh, you know, it, it, I don't think we have enough time for me to go into all the nuances of each right. of those factors. I'd love to we do don't. that with you, yeah. <laughs> but, but, but for the sake of simplicity, uh, when we look at each one, it helps us understand we have a three-dimensional perspective on the market, and that's what produces the consistency that we're known for and mm. the accuracy and the objective decision-making process that we have on the market. I, so I, I, I kind of didn't answer you, but I answered you. <laughs> you answered enough for me. Tony, we've got five minutes before the open and you're constantly trading. So what do you like given where things look like they're going to open specifically? Like, is there anything that the viewers can, I don't want to say piggyback off you because if you take a trade, you took it. It's not my fault. It's not Tony's fault. So remember risk and be careful. But is there anything, Tony, that you want to look at specifically? Um, that you might think is a pretty safe trade or a pretty good trade from your perspective? So, uh, you know, looking at the markets this morning, we've, we thought we were going to open somewhat lower, but looking at SPY queues right now, looks like we're going to be opening anywhere between a half a percent to a quarter percent lower uh, from Friday's close, which is not bad at all. And I think it's just continuing what we, um, what uh, status quo at this point, which is looking for long exposure. Um, there are a few shorts that I'm looking at, but you know, from my perspective right now, the longs that I'm interested in are more so a little bit more defensive. So looking at uh, GLD, um, that I think despite a pullback will still do well. Um, some of the mining stocks. Uh, I'm actually curious about you know where Apple will trade after the open as well. Um, you know, we we've seen this uh, pullback. Um, or I'm sorry, a bit of a consolidation in Apple and, and obviously a bit of a pullback this morning. I, I think that might be an opportunity to potentially go long Apple again. Um, but I would always utilize options here. And I think the big caveat here is we know markets are overextended. We're, we're concerned about a pullback, but it's hard to, to take shorts at this point. So the best exposure that I can get right now is using options, limiting my losses, uh, you know, in a stock like Apple, volatility is relatively low right now. So you can buy options for pretty cheap. Um, I would spread it out as well. I would buy, a, you know, an at the money call and then sell a call maybe about 25, 15, uh, 25 or 20 delta against that going out to maybe April. Um, that would be the type of spread that I'd be looking at on, on a name like Apple. So duration wise, you're looking a little bit longer on the ones you sell. I mean, you're buying a short term uh, no. call and selling longer duration or same duration. No, I'd be I'd be using the same duration. So I'd be using a debit spread where I'd you know looking at where Apple might open right now. It'll be around uh, three seventeen or so, right? Right. So that's I'd what we're maybe as buy. Well. Right. So I, I think I'd maybe look at the April, um, you know, three fifteen, three fifty, um, you know, call spread here. Some some something along those lines, you know. I'd have to see where markets open in terms of those the pricing on those options and whether they, you know, volatility picks up a little. Um, so those are the things I'm monitoring at the moment. Yeah, we've got one up on the screen right now. That same uh, spread you just talked about, and it does look good. I mean, from the perspective of, of the actual chart, the uh, theoretical profit and loss at expiration, the whole setup looks really nice. So Jay, from hmm. a perspective of specifics, first of all, if you have any comments on what Tony said, you know, feel free. But otherwise, is there something specifically you're looking at? Again, we've got time before the open, so I want people to be able to kind of look at it themselves. And again, do your own analysis. Jay's not managing your money. But Jay, what do you think? Uh, to some extent, I agree with what uh, Tony said in the sense that you know what Apple is dealing with is temporary, uh, so it might be a good opportunity to get into it. However, on a drop like today, it's very possible that the put skew, so the 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 put, uh, you know, the let's say the 30-day puts for Apple, they might end up getting bid because of uh, the drop. So it might be not a bad opportunity to sell a put spread, which is a you know still a bullish play, but takes advantage of perhaps higher volatility on the downside because of you know because it's down two percent and perhaps it'll be more 
So depending on where it opens, you know, maybe you pick a price that's five dollars under what the uh, what the price is, and that'll be your your short option. And again, I like to use thirty day trades. So um, and then maybe five strikes lower as your uh, as your long option, just to contain your margin and your risk. So something like that might not be a bad play if it does open down, which is looks like it's going to. Jay, take two seconds if you could and just explain for people who don't know, you're talking about a debit put spread selling uh, closer to at the money and buying a little bit further out. Can you talk just real quick about what that means from a perspective of risk and reward? Just in general. Well, yeah, sure. Uh, you know, when, when you're selling a put spread, you're, you're collecting a premium. Uh, so that is your essentially your max gain, what you collect. Uh, the benefit of that is the odds are generally in your favor. Um, the risk, if you do a put spread, is is just the difference between the strikes minus whatever you take in as a credit. So if you're only doing like a five wide, five strike wide put spread, you're not risking all that much, um, as opposed to the debit spread where you're laying out money. It's a lower probability trade, but if it works out, it's generally higher upside. So it's it's really a probability situation depending on you know whether you want to generate a credit or take a shot at a more directional type play. The credits are definitely higher probability plays, generally speaking. But they're one-to-one, -one, limited risk, same duration. There's no nuances yep. there. It's just the way you want to take advantage of. You two guys think the same move is coming over time. Yeah, and I'm just I'm yes. looking at more of a focus on volatility. And he's, you know, he's probably taking a look. Well, he's also talking about low volatility uh, on the upside. I'm talking about higher volatility on the downside. But really, we're talking about the same thing. Go ahead, Tony. Um, so I was just going to say, I, I actually quite like this trade as well, especially if we do get a bounce on Apple. Um, you know, if we open up, it looks like it is opening up a little lower right now. And volatility spikes a little. Selling that put spread does allow you to take advantage of not only the move higher, but also the what we'll probably see is a decrease in vol as as Apple does trade a little higher. You know, the the trade off here really is the fact that when you sell a put spread, you're risking more money than what you're collecting in terms of income. So it really comes down to, in my opinion, whether or not you believe Apple is going to rally significantly. If you think it can rally significantly, in my opinion, the, the debit spread where you're buying that call spread makes more sense to me because I'm risking less money to potentially make more. And if you think that Apple's going to maybe trade in a, in a somewhat range like we have over the last few weeks and you think it might move a little higher around to 320, 325 level, selling that put spread makes a lot of sense. So black swans are not limited to broad markets. Is the Apple guidance, again, it's based off the coronavirus, right? They're not going to be able to get components. They're not going to be able to build the phones, Roger, and they're not going to be able to deliver to clients who want it. So they're guiding down not because the clients don't want the product, but because they can't deliver it. Does this fit the model of a black swan for Apple specifically? You're also bullish equities right now, at least. Yeah. That could change. but Yeah, and, and specifically for Apple, I, I see a minimum target of between 300 to 310, and, and we'll see. We're going to want to cross that bridge when we get there mm -hmm. and see what happens. What kind of market participation do we get? Does, does it start to kind of flow in and really want to unravel further lower? But And that would be a short-term play. Medium-term to long-term, I think we're going to see Apple bounce right back up. And I, I wouldn't disagree with the guys in terms of taking a, a, you know, a, a position that they outlined. I, I would agree with their analysis. So we trade stocks at PATH. We trade stock options. But one of the things I really like about futures, especially it, people know me as a crude guy, right? It's actually the shortest part of my career, but it's the biggest part of my career right now. So I've been doing this for 27 years. I've been involved in crude for about eight, but crude is probably 70, 60, 70% of what I look at now. When I do TV spots, generally people are calling me about crude oil. Uh, Bloomberg calls me all the time and asks me for quotes for their articles about crude oil. And what I like about commodities is their basic supply and demand. You try to boil the market down to supply and demand from how much is being bought and where are those liquidity pools coming from? Is that exactly, right? Exactly, exactly. And, and really, you have to look at um, not just how much, but also what other factors, what components in the market are actually affecting those buying and selling behaviors, right? And you see that in, in the, both the fundamentals, central bank, right? You also see There's the bell. There you go. Yeah. So let's see where we've got a, uh, what do we got up here? Can we put up an Apple chart? Claire, if we could, and uh, Apple's the one I want to watch, and then I want to switch to Walmart pretty quickly. So we did get that Apple opening around 314, 315 and change, right in that area. Uh, looks like we are below 
what Mike and I consider to be key moving averages, a uh, little bit proprietary, but it's basically eight and 21 exponential moving averages and we're below it. And it looks like Apple is trying to break up through it. If we could look at uh, Walmart and see what happened with that. And then I'll jump to the two guys on Skype and see what you guys think of the open. Walmart is, so I like that it's crossing up on the chart here. I don't care, I don't buy on moving average crosses. I'm gonna get the, guy, the professionals on the set here are gonna roll their eyes if they think I buy on a moving average cross, I don't. But I do like that the moving averages were crossing on that last chart. Now wait a minute, what do we have up here? This is a daily, right? So Walmart's around 119, up 2%. Yeah, I like this. So let's start with Jay, if I could. Uh, does either one of these opens change what you said earlier or kind of confirm them? I'd say it confirms it right now. Walmart opened, I'm sorry, uh, Apple opened a little bit lower than uh, even what it was showing, although it's trying to break higher. But uh, you got to you gotta figure uh, that put skew is, is that the puts are going to be a little bit more expensive. And I think that that short put spread is definitely in order here or the credit spread, whatever you, you want to name it. I just spilled water out of my E-Trade bottle. And that's one of the good things of having a beard. My beard caught <laughs> the water. So I don't think it's on my shirt. Tony, do the, uh, does the open change your mind? Confirm? He actually looks like he's trading. Like, I don't think he's paying attention to us right now. <laughs> Tony, what do you see here? Um, it confirms what I, what I, what I was viewing. I, I really like Walmart. Um, you know, if you look at that chart, what I loved about Walmart is that it's consolidated for quite a bit over the last couple of, of months. Or, and then what we've seen is a breakout you know, on earnings today. And a lot of times we use, uh, you know, it's these earnings catalysts that, tr that provide the catalyst that we, that we want to see from a technical chart perspective. You know, Walmart has had this huge, huge run from uh, all the way down from 85 all the way up to about 122 consolidated over the last couple of uh, months and then has spent the um, uh, uh, just on I think it was Friday when it broke out above its 20 day moving average, which to me is single sig signals that this is starting to make uh, another resumption of, of that move higher. So this is this I think is a good setup for Walmart more so than Apple. I'm you know, Apple seems to has pulled back quite a bit um, it's trading it around. Uh, well, it's back up to 317 already, which is stronger than I expected. So I actually think Apple here from my perspective, is a potential um, long opportunity, especially if you look at also, you know, uh, th there was some news this morning out of China saying that, uh, you know, th this is a record low in terms of new cases this week. Um, so things may be starting to turn around. Obviously, one day is not enough uh, to make a trend, but, you know, there are some early data that shows that perhaps the coronavirus is starting to be a little bit more contained. Right, and I think one of the things people don't understand about the coronavirus, COVID-19, is that it's not necessarily, I have a friend who's a nurse and she said to me, people need to stop going crazy about coronavirus because 10,000 people in the US die from the flu. I think we're at 1,800 deaths in coronavirus. But the issue with coronavirus, again, COVID-19, is it's got a 2% death rate where the flu, the common flu, which affects about 1.9 million Americans per season, you've got 20 times less of a death rate. Also, it tends to run its course, like we understand the course of that. So that's kind of, it's not the virus itself that could potentially be a black swan, but if all at once, like Tony said, it's we have one day of data that's a little bit better. Last time we had a day of data, the next day they reclassified right. the diagnosis and we jumped up by 15,000 cases in a day. Also, by the way, 80% of the cases are mine. So we have to keep that in mind. We may be, as market participants overreacting to this. But again, those things tend to be opportunities. We're not talking about the human toll. By the way, we're never talking about, we're never ignoring and we're never talking about the human toll. That's just not our job here. But from a perspective of the markets in general, when there was about 4,000 cases and about 200 deaths, Goldman Sachs predicted a one-tenth to two tenth percent drop in global GDP. It's got to be higher now, right, Roger? I, I would say it's a little bit higher, but but I think again we have to be careful because a, a lot of the you know the media will sensationalize something, and it can create a kind of a, an exaggerated response. And then now I think we're starting to see the things kind of calm down and kind of stabilize a little bit. But I, so I, again, I wouldn't put too much weight on it. 
I think we're uh, starting to understand part of the reason we want to do this show, honestly, is because we want to talk about things like these guys just did before they happen. So we've got three active investors here, traders, two educators, two institutional guys, all talking about things that were going to happen when the bell rang, as opposed to, wow, this is up 3%. What do you think about it? You know, that hindsight stuff. So before I go to the next set of guests, um, Tony, if somebody wants to find you, where can they find you? Uh, you can find us at optionsplay.com. I'm also on CNBC every Friday on Options Action at 5.30 p.m., where we put out trade ideas just like this. You know, this t on Friday, we put out a, a long Domino's pizza trade going into earnings. These are the types of trades that we like to talk about prior to earnings and set up a trade so that you can see how, how we like to trade these types of events. Jay, same question. Investorsalley.com is the place to find me and uh, go to the site and uh, should be easy at that point. And where do you buy your clippers for the beard? <laughs> I don't use clippers. I just let it grow. boy. Roger, where can people find you if they want to get a hold of you? At marketforecastingacademy.com. And I'll say one, one last thing here. I, I do think that you still have a good potential for a nice pullback, which will create a, a, a beautiful situation for, uh, for going along, getting in. Whether you're an options player or, or you're, uh, you're an equities person, I think we're due for another pullback. Per perfect. Guys, thanks for being here. When we come back, Thank we're going to have Bill Baruch, Mike Arnold, and Anthony Grizzanti. We're going to be talking about gold, the Russell, crude oil. Stay with us. It's going to be a good discussion. 24-7 access to diverse global markets. Right here. That's why I added stock index futures to my trading strategy. Now when I see ups and downs coming, I'm ready. Well played. to my trading strategy. Now, I have 24-7 access to diverse global markets, including crude oil. Like I always say, leave no opportunity untapped. <laughs> I'll just sign that. Yeah, got it. Welcome back. We have a new set of guests. We have an open market. We have some new subjects. With me on set now is Bill Baruch, Blue Line Futures and Blue Line Capital. Yes, that is right. You are what? CEO, Chief Strategist? President. Everything, yeah. President. Yeah. Best looking guy at the company. <laughs> I like to think so. We're not going to talk about how handsome we think each other is here. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself before I go to the other guests and what you guys do. Well, Blue Line Futures is a uh, futures and commodities brokerage firm. We work with retail traders all the way up to institutional guys, help them get memberships to the floor. Uh, and then on Blue Line Capital, uh, we wealth management. Uh, it's, uh, by client demand, we wanted they wanted us to start managing funds of theirs in their portfolio, doing some stuff on the fixed income side. So that's exciting as well. Capital's recently launched. Right? Yes, last summer. Last summer, great. Congratulations on that. Thank you. On the screen here, I've got Grizz Anthony Grizzanti. By the way, Bill's a CNBC guy. Grizz is a CNBC guy. I spent a lot of time on CNBC with Grizz, and I've got, of course, my partner of about twelve years, Mike, with Path Trading Partners. About 12 yes, years of, of help long. for Mike. Um, Grizz, let me go to you first. What do you do? What are you doing now? And uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and your experience. Well, I mostly trade oil right now um, and energy. Uh, my experience is uh, I started out with Bear Stearns about 25 years ago. Um, left them in the uh, middle of the 90s, actually 30 years ago at Bear Stearns. Left them in the mid-90s and started my own thing, GRZ Energy where we could focus mostly on energy, um, natural gas, things like that, the derivatives of energy. Um, and that's what I trade right now. Mike, good to have you back, buddy. Uh, two seconds good to on be here. Everybody knows you already. What, uh, could you repeat that, Bob? Yeah, two seconds on yourself and what you do. Like I said, everybody knows you already, so. I veto everything you come up with, so. <laughs> It's the worst you know, thing in the world, by the way, systems. guys. 
we do a lot of technical trading here. So I vet the technical systems, help develop them with the, the development programmers, uh, test them, uh, make sure we're not doing anything stupid from a fundamental perspective. And uh, even though we're incorporating more fundamentals into our pure technical systems, because we can start doing that now, there's a whole new field rolling out with you can actually technical fundamentals. Mm. So it's it's very interesting now. It's interesting time for system development. Yeah, it kind of matches up with what we were talking to Roger about earlier. So we're going to get into crude oil first because I know that Grizz is chomping at the bit. But just sort of in general, the commodity markets, Billy, what? How do you feel about what's been going on? There's obviously been some volatility. Uh, you and I were talking about copper earlier. So you're pretty interested in, in sort of the moves in copper lately. So you want to just kind of give us a look? Absolutely, absolutely. Well, it, copper is one of the ones that's going to keep a really big pulse on China. And we haven't had hard data yet. Obviously, today's New York manufacturing number was better than expected. That kind of soothed the overall market at 7.30 a.m. Central Time. But, but copper is going to get that impact from, from China. We have a trade alerts program. It was up 11.2% in 2019. Today, we're putting on a trade in copper. Uh, it's, a, it's similar to a butterfly. We, we're actually buying the June contract, 250 puts, selling the 230 puts two times, and buying actually the 210 puts two times. So a little bit of a, of a kicker on the, on the end of the butterfly. But this gives us some exposure if, if copper, which has had a lot of volatility in the last couple uh, weeks here, picks up back, back again to the downside. Do, do me a favor, just like take a deep breath and explain whether that's bullish bearish for people who don't know what well, that trade would be doing. It's a bearish play, and copper copper fell out of bed. I mean, it, it was close to $3, went down to 250 volatility picked up really big, but we bounced up to 260 here, uh, and this gives you some, a, a chance now to step in as we've come up. This is a bearish play. You This is planning on seeing copper lower between 230 and 250 over the next couple of months. But if it really falls apart very quickly, that's why we added that kicker in the butterfly down at 210. So we get some extra exposure if it really just starts rolling over. Grizz, you have any opinion on metals before I go to Mike? I'm going to give Mike a chance to put his copper chart up. Do you um, have any opinion on, on metals or are you just focused on energy entirely? Obviously, when we're talking about copper, we're talking about China, right? I mean, that's yeah, I actually, uh, you know about. what, I actually like the copper trade a lot. I, I don't think that China's out of the woods yet. And, you know, if things start coming back in China, you're not going to see manufacturing coming back as fast as other other things. So I, I do like the copper trade. Gold is another one that I'm looking at. Um, you know, I, I'm very surprised at the strength that's shown, even with the dollar strength um, shown on, which really leads me to believe that investors are looking kind of for a hedge or a little bit of protection against the downside in the equities market. So I do like gold. I, I like like it to continue where it is, trading about 1590 right now. Um, but I like it over 1600. I like it to go over 1600, I should say. You know, something we said before the break is I don't really care about the why of things all that often. I care about the what. So just real quick, Grizz, usually you have a dollar gold inverse relationship. Why do you Absolutely. see them going up together right now, in your opinion? And, and you're seeing them both together, which tells me that there's more than that relationship, that dollar inverse gold relationship that's going on right now. And it, it shows me that, it, you know, investors are looking for some sort of protection or some sort of hedge in equities. And that's why they're adding gold, even with um, a strong dollar right now. And, you know, that's kind of the way I trade, Bob. I look If I'm looking at it as something kind of like a day trade, I look at the, the technicals more than anything else right now. And I, I go with trends. And right now, gold, it, the trend is kind of your friend at this point. Um, when I'm looking at a more longer term trade, I look at more like fundamentals, especially when it comes to energy. Mike, you got an opinion on copper at all? And I know you're looking at a gold trade. So let's just kind of roll through. If you have an opinion on copper, let's hear it. And then let's talk about what you're looking at in gold. Well, it's interesting because back uh, uh, around the third or the fourth of February, copper had a capitulation technical buy signal which ran it up with a full target of around 261.50. We're now sitting in a neutral zone and we have another potential, it, it's, it's neutral. If it drops back below 258, we go back into bearish mode and we'll start watching for the lower prices. We have the signal potential if we get a close above, let me see here, 262.75, then we have your favorite name trading system, the ice cream trade, <laughs> which gives you a long signal back to about the 267 area. So duration, what, where, where, 
What's your duration on a long and a short? Not how long you're going to be in These it. These are very short-term short trades. These are like one to two week trade out. They're not. There's nothing on the medium or the longer term durations yet. These are all based off swing trades. By the way, if you actually want to know what an ice cream trade is, that's an actual trade he has. It's an actual setup called the ice cream trade. But you're getting exposure to copper, Bill. So you're getting exposure to China, right? Yes, absolutely. So do you see them as... So Anthony said, Grizz said, I don't see China recovering anytime soon. I'm paraphrasing. I don't think that was the exact quote, but mm -hmm. he doesn't see it coming anytime soon. You have the same opinion at this point? I think we're going through a couple phases. We're gyrating out right now. Obviously, the initial fear. We saw that fall out into Super Bowl weekend and recovery when China reopened. Now, we haven't seen any hard data. Surprisingly, New York Fed manufacturing this morning was better. But we haven't seen hard data from the impact of coronavirus yet. I think we'll start to see that, and that's going to put a little bit of fear back in. Overall, though, I, I think what we're going to see is, is an impact to quarter one, but overall, the yearly impact is going to smooth out. So we're going to get that fear, I think, coming in here over the next couple of weeks. It's going to be very hard to time. Could last through the end of March. But then I'd be ready to see overall this, this uh, smooth out, the overall growth for China smooth out closer to 6% than people may imagine when that fear kicks in here in the next couple of weeks. I'm going to go to Grizz, then back to Bill. Then I want to jump to Mike because there's two trades we want to look at. And that's the reason I want to go in this order. But Grizz, do you have any fear with what we just saw with the Walmart earnings were weak? Consumer uh, retail sales last week, the headline was strong, but the core was weak. Do you feel like China's bleeding into the U.S. or it's not going to, just generally? I think generally it's, it's causing caution. Let's, let's look at it that way. Um, but I, I don't think that it's, it's, the impact has been fully felt over on this side of uh, the pond right now. I, I think that uh, we're very cautious in the U.S. I think investors are very happy that our market has held up so well. But I think they also, you know, they're watching the news very carefully. And then that's another reason why, you know, let's go back to gold, why gold is higher. Bill, same question. I, I think, I mean, we, we, he mentioned gold, and, and I want to go back to gold on, on the U.S. dollar. I mean, the U.S. dollar is acting like a safe haven. It acted like a safe haven last year as well. And I think gold is one that's, that's going ahead, higher with the dollar. Um, but I also want to keep an eye on treasuries. You know, we can't, you can't talk about gold right now without talking about the treasuries. And the 30-year bond has performed since, since uh, Friday's close pretty well. That's keeping, keeping a bid under gold, too. So if you are trading gold, you know, watch the 30-year bond very closely. And days where the bond is up and the dollar's up, that could help explain why gold is up. Mike, we, you've got a gold trade, and then you've got a crude trade, which I want to bounce off Grizz before we talk about it. So when we come back, Mike, I want to start with you, talk specifically about the gold trade, and then look at the crude trade. I think we're going to put the crude trade on if the circumstances are still uh, ripe for us to do that. So stick with us. Gold and crude is next. futures to my trading strategy. Now, I have 24-7 access to diverse global markets, including crude oil. Like I always say, leave no opportunity untapped. <laughs> I'll just sign that. Yeah. Got it. We are back with Bill Baruch, Anthony Grizanti, Grizz, and Mike Arnold. I want to start with you. You have your eye on gold and you have your eye on crude. Let's talk about gold first because we've talked about that a little bit prior to this break. And then I want to go to crude because I got my crude guy here. Um, I think the only guy who knows more about crude than I do is on the screen right now. So, Mike, gold, what are you looking at? We had a continuation buy last Thursday uh, back at the 140. Eight level and now we also then trigger another continuation buy on a close above 150 so gold is very very bullish from a this is GLD by the way I'm sorry to interrupt yes. you right we're doing the GLD contract we're doing the GLD ETF instead of just trading the futures on this one 
But any pullback on gold is very attractive, especially even today. And we had a nice gap up over, uh, let's see, we got a high of 149.91, not quite yet to that 150, but any pullback even to where Friday's close was the 149 level is, is a bullish continuation buy pattern. So gold just keeps remaining in bullish mode. And that's basically what Grizz said about the trend is your friend with gold. So let's pull up the Q, uh, the QM, the mini crude oil contract, because again, Mike, if this trade is still kind of in the area where we want to do it, I want to do it because this is a live trading show. I like crude oil short term. Um, it pulled back, Grizz and I had a conversation earlier. He liked it. He liked buying it a little bit lower. So Mike, what's your situation with the crude oil and the way it's lined up right now? We've trig we've got a confirmed double bottom here we so right now it's confirmed on the daily picture it has not triggered at least i've been watching the april contract it has not been triggered on the april contract from during regular market hours we'd need a close above 52.20 for it to be triggered from that perspective. Uh, but the pattern is still in play. The It's a slightly lower probability one because it is against the daily rotation zone, which you alluded to. It's We use that as a filter for a number of our trades, which is the key level we're watching is that 21 day moving average, which is just above it. So you see that double bottom that's now run up, but it's still below that blue line, that 21 day moving average. And that lowers the probabilities. So we would prefer the more conservative entry would be on a close above that a 21 moving average. And All then right, a so we can't, back. we can't, you're vetoing me is what you're saying. We can't I, do it. I am vetoing it from a pure technical probability perspective. It is still lower, lower probability until we get above that key moving average. Such a load of crap. I'm getting vetoed here. Grizz, what do you think about April crude oil? Uh, again, we, this is a live trading event, but we're not going to force a trade. I mean, we've done trades in the other shows. No, There's not right, a trade exactly. to take, so. You know what? I think it's smart. Number one, to look at April. March goes off the board on the 20th, so a couple days from now, I'm looking at the same thing. Um, and right now, I agree with the assessment that we're kind of in no man's land right now. I have 52.60 as um, the 21-day moving average on my uh, on my on my chart, my daily chart. Um, and above there, I would almost be a buyer, but. In, in below that, uh, I would wait a little bit. I see um, four bottoms between 49, uh, roughly 60 and 49.30. I think we take another shot at that. And this is where I get back into the fundamentals of the market. If you looked at the supply numbers over the last three weeks, we have unexpectedly built crude oil supply over three weeks. Gasoline looks pretty good right now. We're ramping up for that season uh, at this point. So crude should be used a little bit more, but demand for gasoline isn't quite there yet. So the refineries haven't completely ramped up yet because as I just said, supplies for gasoline are good. So why add more to that as we go into the season? Um, I think crude takes another shot uh, below 50 to test that area. I think if it gets below that 49, 30 that I said that all bets are off, I think we're going back to, uh, to $47. But I think that uh, as it I would take a shot and buy it just above that, say $49.90, $50, and then use that $49.30 as your stop, as your exit point if we get below that. But I think that um, you're going to see another shot down in that market, especially if equities start to hit south. So because I got Grizz here, I get to geek out a little bit over, over crude oil. So I've got two comments and one question, Grizz. Number one, the refinery utilization dipped below 90 and really struggled to get back above it, not above it as of the last EIA. And when I looked at the data, when we got below 90, um, it was one of the longest stretches since about 2011 to get back above 90. And then we dipped below it again, which is seasonally correct. So number one, uh, that's a comment. Number two is from a perspective of the supplies, we built the last three weeks in a row, and this is a question, not a comment, but we're 2% below the five-year average on inventories. Does that tell you that the old, two-year-old, 25-month-old OPEC production cuts actually started to bite? And now if we get new production cuts, it might actually make a difference? Or do you just see that as like a temporary adjustment based on maybe refinery utilizations picked up a little bit and hasn't come out yet? 
Uh, I think it's a bit of a blip right now, Bob. When you look at the market as a whole, uh, right now we're in contango. It's slight, but we're in contango right now. So Tell everybody what a contango is real quick. Contango is when the front month is actually cheaper than the back months going forward. So it's saying that forward demand isn't really that good right now. And going back to the refiners, the reason why those numbers, those refining numbers were so low, the util utilization was so low, is because demand for gasoline has been so low. Usually around uh, peak demand, and in driving season, we average about 9.6 million barrels a day. And then it falls off as we get later into the winter and people stay inside more and don't drive. Um, there was a figure, implied demand, 8.8 .8 million barrels a day, which is extremely low. It's been years and years. It was actually a financial crisis when I saw a number like that last. So the demand really isn't there right now. And as I mentioned before, refiners don't want to ramp up and make so much of a product that they can't sell at this point. So, uh, from a perspective so that's why of, I think gasoline came back or, or took a long time to come back. From a perspective of what Mike said about vetoing that I wanted to buy crude oil, which I'm pissed off at you, Mike. Billy, what we had imports drop a little bit. And to my question about whether um, can crude oil rally off of a supply cut or does it there have to be a demand thing now? No, absolutely it can rely off a of supply cut. But the thing is that Russia isn't really on board right now with right. that supply cut. The Saudis are doing everything they can, and the rest of OPEC seems to be doing everything they can. And plus, you have a couple of supply cuts that weren't really um, supposed to be supply cuts. Libya one that I'm thinking of right now. Their, their production has been way down only because of the conflicts going on in that country. Um, but yeah, um, not everybody's on board right now. You Let get me go to Bill with the board, same, question. same question. I, I, I think the market started to price in the potential of, of, of Russia joining, and they didn't, I mean, but the market's held this hope over the last couple of sessions. And, and today you're seeing a, the double hit here, Apple reminding everybody that, that we haven't had the hard data yet from the impact of coronavirus. And we've also seen the, the, that hope dissipate of, of, of Russia joining this cut. So that's putting pressure on crude oil. I mean, Anthony's really pointed out a lot of the, a lot of the fundamentals in the supply side, the utilization. I think that right now is a bearish. I'm actually short crude oil right now. I, I got short into the last week. Uh, I, I, when I sell something, I'm not just going out right with the stop. I, I have a, a call ladder protecting myself with that. I'm actually long the 52 uh, April calls. I'm short some above 57 and a half, 58 and a half to, to bring in some premium there. But overall, I, I do think, as Grizz said, that there's there's going to be another move lower. We're building for it right now. I'm not extremely bearish on the, on the global economy but I think there's commodities that, that there's some momentum lower right now, that, that there are some opportunities to be seen. I think that's what we're seeing play out here in, in crude oil, play out here in, in copper as well. Mike Grizz said it, he thinks it's going to get below 50 on the crude oil contract. Does that negate your pattern? Yeah, if we get below 50, we're now in triple bottom territory, which then we start looking for more of the continuation pattern. We're in bearish mode still on a weekly basis. Uh, in a then the key level becomes at 49.31. 49.31, if we get the close below that, that's a bearish continuation sell pattern, which with a target then down at about $45. Wow, so we're seeing, by the way, we're also seeing a spike in volume in this April contract. You look on the bottom of the E-Trade chart here on the Power E-Trade platform, we've got a pretty decent spike in volume and it's pretty early in the day. And the last commitment of traders report I looked at, uh, the shorts had kind of been dialing back as opposed to anything else. So I'm curious, anybody cares about this move compared with that kind of spike in volume that we saw at the open? And Grizz, let's go to you first. Do you care about that? Um, I do care about that. Um... You know, but I, I'm melding it along with everything else. And right now, the fundamentals of this market kind of outweigh everything in my head. Um, and that's why I think that we're going to head a little bit lower before we head higher. I think that in, in the middle of the summer, or June, July, you're going to see crude oil back to $55. I just think it takes another run for these lows. So we are running low on time here. I want to get off of crude oil because Bill's got an opinion on the Russell. Yeah. So I want to go into what the trade is that you're looking at, whether you did it or not and tell me why you're looking at the Russell, because I have a pretty strong opinion on the Russell as well. Yeah, I, I think the Russell's lagged. I, I think from a portfolio perspective, it's, it's always look, good to look and get protection when you don't need it. And, and, and then, you know, you don't want to get it when you, when you do need it. That's when it's, when it's already making you money or should, have, should be. So I, I think there's a couple of ways. I don't like going out and just buying premium outright. So one of the things, I, I've been doing this in the futures already. I think the fact that the, the, the Russell's lag completely leaves this open for a potential rollover if, if we start to see these, the impact of that hard data, things like Apple continue to happen. Um, 
I'm looking at the Russell 160. Well, go to the IWM. I'm looking at the 168 puts. And if you sell those, I mean, sell the put at the money, and then buy two of the 164 puts, so a one by two, you're actually going to give yourself unlimited downside rather than buying a spread. But you can also play around with it. So I think this this on the IWM is going to cost it's a debit about three bucks on it. So this gives you good protection to the downside. And then again, you can play around with something like this. We sell off real sharply. You can go and sell a a, a 150 put for a buck and a half or so, or potentially more, depending how much lower we are. If we rally, you could actually trade out of those 168s and then put them back on so it gives you you know a way to feel involved in the market and and i've it's, it's something that i've been working with clients over the past year to two especially along this equity market rally where a lot of retail people want to come in and, and be a hero to try and pick the top in the in the s p and i've seen a lot of people lose a lot of money trying to do that so i tell them you know there's different strategies to use such as these one by twos it give you keep you in the market it keep you you know occupied with playing the, these little bit of swings and you can trade around a little bit less risk, but you also can make some really good money if it, if it comes out. And we can do this in the futures as well. I mean, that's Absolutely. what I would be doing yes. in the futures personally. Yes. So from a perspective of the Russell, just my opinion uh, as we wind down here today, the Russell historically outperforms the larger indices anyway. Now that might be changing with the tech leadership. I don't know. But from a perspective of a low interest rate environment, it's the smaller cap companies in the Russell 2000 that actually take advantage of lower interest rates through lines of credits and actual traditional bank loans and things like that. Yet the Russell continues to outperform. Does any of that go into your analysis? And this stuff you're talking to clients about as well. Well, I think one of the reasons too is, is you're not seeing that outperformance. You're obviously tech, the behemoths are, are driving the market, but the fact that we they haven't incurred the gains when they typically would see them. Now, what if we do start to see those bigger names sort of just kind of come back a little bit? And again, I'm not bearish to market. I'm not I'm not picking a top here in the S&P. We can see Apple had a target of 324. I mean, there's different upside targets I'm looking at in the market, uh, but there's gonna, go, there's gonna be these gyrations. And I think that the fact that when we see the next three to 5% down, in the in the S and P, you could see five to seven percent in the Russell, and that's what I'm prepared for. Mike, we are running out of time. Do you have any opinion on the Russell, just off the top of your head? Actually, I like that trade a lot. The the one he just outlet outlined, whether you do it in the futures or in the IWM, and the Russell has been lagging, and I like it as a downside play. We've had a triple divergent sell signal, uh, not a short, but a triple divergent sell signal on the S and P E minis. And I have to reiterate that, that not to go short, because I think the better short, potential short play is the one that's already been outlined in the Russell because it has been lagging. But this, the upside momentum has been waning. So it's, it's at least from the S&P perspective, it's a profit taking time and then look to add back on, on a uh, short term pullback. Real quick, Mike, and then I want to go to Grizz on the Russell as well, but Mike, on this crude trade, because you didn't allow me to do it, as the market moves, uh, where should we do it? Where can you not do it? Where's your stop if you get long? Okay, if we get that close above the 5260 area, that's the signal to go long. Stop below 50. Uh, eventually, full target is 55. It's We have two different target areas, 54.96 to 55.03, so I'm just using the 55 as the target. Stop reduction, 53.60 area. Grizz, the so Russell, can, you got an opinion on it? Well, you know, it, it's heavily weighted in domestic names. So if you think that most of the U.S. companies can kind of insulate themselves from what's going on in the rest of the world, then you got to like it. If, if you think that it's a global economy and everybody's going to be affected, then, you know, you got to watch out. Right. So overall, Grizz, you like crude oil. You want to buy it lower. You like gold. I do. I like them both. I like them uh, both just a little bit lower. Uh, not so much the gold as much as the crude oil. The, the gold, I think probably 1580 is where I'd like to get in. Crude oil, about a buck and a half lower. Billy, anything uh, you want to throw in as we wind down here? So first of all, I want you to tell everyone where they can find you if they need to find you. But kind of last words on the whole market. Well, last words, I think something that's that's really not talked about enough are, are MLPs, energy ones, energy especially. Um, Alarian ET is an ETF. Uh, AMLP is the is the uh, ticker, and this is something that that gives you. It's down six percent on the year or so right now. It's it, it's a midstream energy uh, ETF, and ultimately what what you're looking at is is the dividend you're going to get. You're getting a ten percent dividend to hold this thing after selling off. Again, I, I'm not I'm not 
bearish long term. I think there's opportunities in shorter term, intermediate term trades for commodities. But looking farther out in the portfolio, having something like AMLP, uh, energy MLPs in your portfolio, portfolio is extremely important longer term. You worry about any of the bankruptcies that might be in the MLP? I, I think, I mean, they've been covering these dividends with, with cash. I mean, at a higher rate than ever before, or really a long time, I guess. So I, I'm not too concerned about that right now. And I, I think given given where we're seeing uh, support at $50 in crude oil. Now, if crude oil breaks below 49, there's a big trend line. I'm mean, going to be concerned near term, but I, I still like the energy MLP space uh, for now. And some of the shale patch guys, I saw a CEO in an interview this morning, and I'm not going to say which company just because I didn't watch the whole interview, Grizz, but they basically said that they're continuing with the cost cutting, trying to get their break even below $40. So. Um, the overall, your overall opinion on the shale patch, Chris, and again, then I want to go back to you guys and let everybody know where they can get a hold of you if they need to. Well, here we go. Um, you know, not a lot of them make money at this point. Yeah. And if it does get below, say, that 49 area, 45, and it stays there, that's how long, that's really what what matters, how long it stays there. You're going to see a lot of bankruptcies. And you're also not going to see the money being thrown at it like it was, say, in 09 and 010 because at that point it was pretty much an unknown we didn't know whether or not they're going to make money it doesn't look like many of them make money at this point so why would you throw more money at something like that so i think we're in a very precarious spot if if we have months of below 45 you're going to see a lot of that production come offline and ultimately it's going to lead to a lot higher prices in crude oil Grizz, where can people get a hold of you if they need to uh, you know what? You can find me on Twitter, Anthony Grizz, or just uh, shoot me an email at grz90 AOL. I'm old school. Mike, <laughs> an AOL email. Yes. Is there still an AOL stock? I don't even know. If it, what, what is it now? Time Warner? I, mean, I don't like, invest in the stock, but I still have the email. <laughs> that is awesome. Mike Arnold, if somebody wants to get a hold of you and get their trades vetoed, um, where do they go? They can go to our website, uh, pathtradingpartners.com, or they could email us at support at pathtradingpartners.com, and uh, I will be on that veto chain the moment I get the e email. <laughs> uh, by the way, when Mike started vetoing my trades is when it actually started to make a difference, so it was a good thing. People don't realize that there's three possible outcomes to a trade, a win, a loss, and a break even. Two of those are good, and if you're out of a trade, you're break even. So essentially, it's the same thing. Billy, where can people reach you? Uh, Blue Line Futures. That's the best place to find us. We put a lot of research up there. It's available. It's free to people that swing by to see it. Um, hit our contact info there, bluelinefutures.com. That's my, that's my futures and commodities company, uh, and, and we're, we're looking forward to talking to people. So I want to say, all three of us that are CNBC guys are better online than we are on CNBC. <laughs> you know what? I better not say this. Um, yeah, this is part of the reason we do this show, is so that we can speak freely about market events that are happening right now, live charts behind us. I really like to put on live trades in this show. Market didn't give us an opportunity to. So if you remember earlier in the show, Tony Zhang gave you real trades. Jay Soloff gave you real trades. Roger Curry still wants to be long the S&P for now, could change. So I want to thank those three guys. I want to thank Mike Arnold, Anthony Grisanti. Grizz, good to see you again. Billy, I see you all the time, but it's good to see you again. And remember, Pure Exposure Growth Series, we're very happy to connect with you guys. Reach out to us. Next show is going to be in early April. Uh, watch your email or just continue watching us on YouTube, and we'll let you know when that is. Thanks for being here, and you have just been exposed.
the Pure Exposure Growth Series live stream, sponsored by E-Trade and the CME Group. You are being exposed. Mm -hmm.